Dr. Sage here, back discussing microbe-human interactions. In today's video, we're going to talk about when colonization leads to disease. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain some of the variables that influence whether a microbe will cause disease in a particular host. Differentiate between a microbe's pathogenicity and its virulence. List the steps a microbe has to take to get to the point where it can cause disease. List several portals of entry and exit. Define infectious dose and explain its role in establishing infection. Describe three ways microbes can cause tissue damage. Compare and contrast major characteristics of exotoxins and endotoxins. Explain what epigenetic change is and how it can influence virulence. Draw and label a curve representing the course of clinical infection. A pathogen is a microbe whose relationship with its host is parasitic. It results in infection and disease. True pathogens are capable of causing disease in healthy persons with normal immune systems. Opportunistic pathogens cause disease when the host defenses are compromised or when they become established in a part of the body that is not natural to them. Biosafety levels are a system of biosafety categories adopted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Based on general degree of pathogenicity and relative danger in handling these pathogens. Biosafety level one can be used on standard open benches with no special facilities needed. These are typical of most microbiology teaching labs. They pose a low infection hazard and microbes are generally not considered pathogens and will not colonize the bodies of healthy persons. Biosafety level two, at least level one facilities and practices are used Plus, personnel must be trained in handling pathogens. Lab coats and gloves are required. Safety cabinets may be needed. And biohazard signs have to be posted and access has to be restricted. These include agents with moderate potential to infect. Class II pathogens can cause disease in healthy people, but can be contained with proper facilities. Most pathogens belong to Class II. Biosafety Level 3 requires a minimum of Level 2 facilities and practices. Plus, all manipulation has to be performed in safety cabinets. The lab will be designed with special containment features and only personnel with special clothing can enter. No unsterilized materials can leave the lab. Personnel are warned, monitored, and vaccinated against infection dangers. These agents can cause severe or lethal disease, especially when inhaled. Biosafety Level 4 requires a minimum of Level 3 facilities and practices. Plus, facilities must be isolated with very controlled access. Clothing changes and showers are required for all personnel entering and leaving. Materials must be autoclaved or fumigated prior to entering and leaving the lab. These agents are highly virulent microbes that pose extreme risk for morbidity and mortality when inhaled in droplet or aerosol form. Virulence is a degree of pathogenicity. It's indicated by a microbe's ability to establish itself in the host and cause damage. Virulence factor is any characteristic or structure of the microbe that contributes to toxin production or induction of an injurious host response. Infectious dose is the minimum number of microbes required for an infection to proceed. This is determined experimentally for many microbes. Microbes with smaller infectious dose have greater virulence. The steps involved when a microbe causes diseases in a host include portals of entry, attaching to the host, surviving host defenses, causing disease, and then vacating the host or portals of exit. Okay, starting with step one, portals of entry, a characteristic route taken by a microbe to initiate infection, usually through skin or mucous membranes. The source of the infectious agent could be exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous is originating from outside the body, so from the environment, another person or animal, Endogenous is already existing on or in the body. For example, normal biota or a previously silent infection. Common portals of entry include the eye, nose, mouth, and ear, needles, broken skin, insect bites, placenta, which is a portal entry for the fetus, urethra, vagina, and anus. So infectious agents that enter the skin can enter through nicks, abrasions, punctures, and some can be tiny and inapparent. Intact skin is a very tough barrier that few microbes can penetrate. Some infectious agents create their own passageways into the skin using digestive enzymes. The gastrointestinal tract can be a portal of entry. 
This can be entry through food, drink, or other ingested substances. The organisms that use this portal are adapted to survive digestive enzymes and abrupt pH changes. One example is H. pylori. Typically, contact with stomach acid keeps the mucin lining the epithelial cell layer in a spongy gel-like state. This consistency is impenetrable to the bacteria H. pylori. However, the bacteria releases urease, which neutralizes the stomach acid. This causes the mucin to liquefy, and the bacterium can swim right through it. The respiratory system is another portal of entry. Gateways to the respiratory tract include the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. There is a continuous mucous membrane covering the upper respiratory tract, sinuses, and auditory tubes. Microbes often transferred from one site to another. The extent to which an agent is carried into the respiratory tract is based on its size. Small cells and particles are inhaled more deeply than larger ones. There are urogenital portals of entry. These would be the sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. These are pathogens transmitted by sexual means. They account for 4% of infections worldwide. 13 million new cases in the United States occur each year. They obtain entry through points through the skin or mucosa of the penis, external genitalia, vagina, cervix, or urethra. There are pathogens that affect during pregnancy and birth. The placenta is an exchange organ. It's formed by maternal and fetal tissues. It separates the blood of the developing fetus from that of the mother. It permits diffusion of dissolved nutrients and gases to the fetus. A few microbes can cross the placenta and are spread by the umbilical vein into the fetal tissues. Other infections are transmitted perinatally as the child passes through the birth canal. So common infections of the fetus and neonate are often abbreviated TORCH. These include toxoplasmosis. Other diseases like syphilis, coxsackie virus, varicella zoster virus, AIDS, and chlamydia rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex virus. The most serious complications are spontaneous abortion, congenital abnormalities, brain damage, prematurity, and stillbirths. All right, step two is attaching to the host. Adhesion is a process by which microbes gain a more stable foothold on host tissues. It's dependent on binding between specific molecules on both the host and pathogen. A particular pathogen is limited to only those cells and organs to which it can bind. Once attached, a pathogen can invade body compartments. Quorum sensing is chemical communication between nearby bacteria, which is critical to establishment of infection. So some examples of adhesive properties of microbes include the microbe that causes disease gonorrhea, where the fimbri attach to genital epithelial cells. Fimbri can also be used by E. coli to cause diarrhea and urinary tract infections, or by Shigella to cause dysentery. Mycoplasma causes pneumonia, and they have a specialized tip at ends of the bacteria that diffuses tightly to the lung epithelium. The influenza virus causes the flu, and they have viral spikes that attach to receptors on the cell surface. Poliovirus causes polio. Capsid proteins attach to receptors on susceptible cells. HIV causes AIDS and viral spikes adhere to white blood cell receptors. Phase three is surviving the host defenses. Phagocytes are white blood cells that engulf and destroy pathogens by means of enzymes and antimicrobial chemicals. Antiphagocytic factors, these are virulence factors used by pathogens to avoid phagocytes. They circumvent some part of the phagocytic process. Step four is causing disease. Virulence factors are structures, products, or capabilities that allow a pathogen to cause infection in the host. Adaptations that a microbe uses to invade and establish itself in a host and determine the degree of tissue damage that occurs. They can cause direct damage via enzymes. Exoenzymes are secreted by pathogenic bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and worms. They break down and inflict damage on tissues. They dissolve the host defense barriers and promote the spread of microbes into deeper tissues. As an example, Hyaluronin is a polymer found in the layers of epidermis that connects adjacent cells. Hyaluronidase is produced by bacteria that degrades this adhesive polymer in the extracellular matrix, allowing passage between cells that would otherwise be blocked. Toxins are a potent source of cellular damage. A toxin is a specific chemical product of microbes, plants, and some animals that is poisonous to other organisms. Exotoxins are secreted by a living bacteria cell to the infected tissues. 
And there's many types of exotoxins. Endotoxins are not actively secreted. They're shed from the outer membranes, and they're only found in gram-negative bacteria. Many cases of microbial diseases are the result of indirect damage or the host's excessive or inappropriate response to a microorganism. Pathogenicity is a trait not solely determined by microorganisms. Pathogenicity is a consequence of an interplay between microbe and host. You can have localized infections. That's where a microbe enters the body and remains confined to a specific tissue. Examples are boils, fungal skin infections, and warts. Or you can have systemic infection. That's when an infection spreads to several sites and tissue fluids, usually in the bloodstream. For example, viral includes measles, rubella, chickenpox, and AIDS. Bacteria includes anthrax, typhoid fever, and syphilis. Or fungus can include things like cryptococcus. Infectious agents can also travel by means of nerves, for example, rabies, or cerebrospinal fluid, for example, meningitis. Focal infection exists when the infectious agent breaks loose from a local infection and is carried to other tissues. Examples include tuberculosis, streptococcal pharyngitis, which causes scarlet fever, toxemia, which is infection remains localized, toxins are carried through the blood to the target tissues. Mixed infection is where several agents establish themselves simultaneously at the infection site. Polymicrobial diseases, for example, gas gangrene, wound infections, dental caries, and human bite infections. The primary infection is the initial infection. Secondary infection occurs when a primary infection is complicated by another infection caused by a different microbe. Acute infections come on rapidly and have short-lived effects. Chronic infections progress and persist over a long period of time. So what are the signs and symptoms or warning signals of disease? A sign is any objective evidence of disease as noted by an observer, and it's more precise than symptoms. Symptom is a subjective evidence of disease as sensed by the patient. Syndrome is a disease identified or defined by a certain complex of signs and symptoms. Common signs of infectious disease include fever, susceptosemia, microbes and tissue fluids, chest sounds, skin eruptions, leukocytosis, leukopenia, swollen lymph nodes, abscesses, tachycardia, and antibodies and serum. Common symptoms of infectious diseases include chills, pains, aches, soreness, irritation, malaise, fatigue, chest tightness, itching, headache, nausea, abdominal traps, anorexia, and sore throat. Inflammation is the earliest symptom of disease. Edema is accumulation of fluid in affected tissues. Granulomas and abscesses are walled off collections of inflammatory cells and microbes in the tissues. Lymphatitis is swollen lymph nodes. Size of infection in the blood include leukocytosis, that's an increase in levels of white blood cells. Leukopenia, that's decrease in levels of white blood cells. Septicemia, which is general state in which microbes are multiplying in the blood and presence in large numbers. Bacteremia, which is small numbers of bacteria are present in the blood but not necessarily multiplying. Viralemia is presence of viruses in the blood, whether or not they are actively multiplying. There are infections that go unnoticed, asymptomatic, subclinical, or inapparent infections. Those is infected but does not manifest the disease. Patient experiences no symptoms of disease and does not seek medical attention. Most infections are attended by some sort of sign. Step five is vacating the host. Portals of exit are avenues for pathogens to exit the host. These include secretion, excretion, discharge, and sloth tissues. Common portals of exit include the eyes through tears, the nose through secretions, the mouth through saliva and sputum, the ear through earwax, blood through needles, blood through broken skin, milk and secretions from the mammary gland, placenta can cause transmission to the fetus, urine through the urethra, also urine, semen, and secretions through the male urethra, feces through the anus, secretions and blood from the vagina, and flakes from skin. The escape media for pathogens that affect the upper and lower respiratory tract include mucus, sputum, nasal drainage, and other moist secretions. The outer layer of skin and scalp is constantly being shed to the environment. Household dust is composed of skin cells, and a single person can shed several billion skin cells in a day. Some intestinal pathogens cause irritation in the intestinal mucosa that increases the motility of the bowel. Resulting in diarrhea provides a rapid exit for the pathogen. Hemolymph worms release eggs and cysts through feces. 
If feces containing pathogens are a public health problem when allowed to contaminate drinking water or when used to fertilize crops. The urogenital tract, agents involved in STIs leave the host in vaginal discharge or semen. Source of neonatal infections that affect the infant as it passes through the birth canal, for example, herpes simplex, chlamydia, and candidia. Pathogens that affect the kidney are discharged in the urine. Blood has a portal of exit when it is removed or released through vascular puncture. Blood feeding animals are common transmitters of pathogens, for example, ticks and fleas. Long-term infections and long-term effects. Latency is a dormant state of an infectious agent. During this state, the microbe can periodically become active and produce a reoccurrent disease. The agents of syphilis, typhoid fever, tuberculosis, and malaria also enter into latent stages. Sequelae is long-term or permanent damage to organs and tissues. Meningitis can result in deafness. Strep throat can lead to rheumatic heart disease. Lyme disease can cause arthritis, and polio can produce paralysis. The course of infection includes the incubation period, prodromal period, acute phase, and convalescent stage. So the incubation period is a time from initial contact with the infectious agent to the appearance of the first symptoms. The prodromal period is when the earliest notable symptoms of infection appear. During the acute phase, the infectious agent multiplies at high levels, exhibits its greatest virulence, and becomes well established in its target tissues. Convalescent stage is where the patients respond to infection and symptoms decline. So we start with the incubation period where there's not many pathogens present and there's not very severe symptoms. That then leads to the prodromal period where there's an increase in both. Then you have the period of illness where there's a significant increase in both the number of pathogens and the severity of symptoms. After that, there's a period of decline in pathogen number and symptoms, and then a period of convalescence. This has been your introduction to when colonization leads to disease. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.